What's up, everybody? Matt DeMarinas here from whiteandbluereview.com. Um, I'm joined by uh, play-by-play -play man John Bishop and Omaha World Herald superstar Johnny Atawa. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, just Big East Media Day stuff. Honestly, you know, with the way the world's spinning right now, it's uh, we want to be kind of cognizant of not getting too far ahead of ourselves to kind of give you guys, you know, I don't know if hope is the right word we want to squash, but like we just don't want to like, I don't want to like get too far ahead of, you know, what's going on. So uh, there's a lot of stuff to unpack today from Big East Media Day that we're going to talk about. Um, and obviously, I don't think I could have picked two people with better perspectives on what transpired today and um, what we can look forward to, at least from the information we were gathered today. So first of all, John and John, um, thank you for joining me. You are welcome. It's great to be here. It's great to see you guys again. Um, I sure. hope we can see each other in person at some point in the somewhat not too distant future, but this is the next best thing. Yeah. Yeah. Glad, glad to be here. Glad to talk some basketball. Let's do it. I know, this. right? That's what, that's what, that's what we've been can missing. We just, we'll, too much. Yeah. Can we just pretend that it's happening? Yeah, we're going to try to pretend it's best it's happening. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. That, that was the weird thing about Big East Media Day today is that, like, there were a it, cloud. You'd go from a, a well, there'd be a yeah, exactly a cloud, the elephant in the room. Like, there'd be a question about, you know, depth at center or uh, who your impact point guard, and then the next question would be like, but do you think you're gonna play any games? And right. the coach would be like, I don't know, probably not. You know, like it was, <laughs> it was so uh, interesting that juxtaposition of like. Media days are supposed to be filled with optimism, and this one did have some of that, but it also had like the reality of, hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, and isn't that interesting? You know, because we've been most, you know, we've all been ensconced in, in every sport that has played, and and right now it's all about football, because you know that's been the conver really that's been the conversation since they canceled March Madness was well, what's going to happen with football? And the whole off season was football, 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 and we all knew that. You know, for most of these schools, granted, the Big East is different, um, but, you know, football is where all the money is made. And so, um, you know, we at, for, for the longest time there, you know, it was football that had everything going for it. Right. They had all the time in the world. They can plan and they can pre prepare. And then we found out when it came to when push came to shove, no one had a good plan. And, you know, things have been all over the map and no one can agree on anything. Meanwhile, college basketball, the first sport that got shut down in the first place and now has had all this time to learn from the NBA, Major League Baseball, college football, the NFL, all this stuff. And here we are, we're less than a month to the start of the season. And we're still asking a lot of these questions, yeah. you know, it, it's almost as if we, what has it been? Seven months, eight months since everything started. Um, and it almost feels like we haven't learned anything, which is uh, stunning to me. I mean, obviously, we've learned things about the virus and stuff, but as far as how to handle it, how to work with it, how to play with it, um, play inside of a pandemic, we, we haven't learned. It feels like we haven't learned anything. Well, I think we've learned how to do it. It's just like there's there's a lot of parts of college basketball that are, you know, the powers that are trying to cling on to that amateurism mm -hmm. that they don't want to necessarily. Right. I yeah. Yeah. That's true. Because cause honestly, a bubble works like we know that is like foolproof. <laughs> We've seen that. That, that is, I mean, we did, we did. Like, but, we, we know the method that will work. We just, they're not ready to concede that that's what needs to happen in terms of um, basically labeling athletes as like must or essential employees to the, the continuation of college basketball inside of a bubble, basically. I would be interested to hear, you know, and I don't know how in depth you can, you're going to get with some of these guys, but give the give the nba guys you know a few more weeks or whatever to kind of absorb everything to hear their perspective on how it went because i can't imagine yes it was successful i'm not doubting you know the success of it in terms of a did they play basketball yes did they get through it without a positive test yes um but the psychological effects you know yeah. being away being you know it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like being in prison in in a weird way even though you're not in prison obviously right. but you're you're kind of entrapped there and it's a different feeling so i did do a podcast with uh, i was gonna say I, I was gonna say real quick matt I, I feel like that was the uh 
the main that's like the main deterrent isn't it i mean there you mm-hmm. might argue that behind the scenes there might be this tug and pull of amateurism versus are these guys employees type thing and that i'm not denying that exists but i think very real part of the conversation is the mental health piece for athletes because yeah that 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 is tough on even professionals and um it's hard to know exactly what the impact of that would be but go ahead you were about to say something matt well I, can, if i could add one more thing real quick have either of you guys ever done one of those um well it used to be called harris now i don't remember what it is but the, the, the stay overnight lab things you know where you're basically a human guinea pig and you get paid like a thousand dollars to uh, have you ever have either of you done no, that i know what you're talking no. about uh, yeah I, I actually did okay so this my dad, is did, my dad did one of those back in back when i was a kid so i did one of those where I think it was three consecutive weekends. So for three consecutive weekends, you checked in on Friday and you had to stay through Sunday. And you kind of, it was almost like you were in the military, right? You were sleeping in kind of barracks. You had to eat a certain, on a, at a certain regimen. You couldn't, you could only do so much. There was a little courtyard outside, but you couldn't see like beyond the building. It was, you know, it was like an enclosed courtyard. And I can remember when I came through all that, how it was like, I, I mean, I know I did this voluntarily and I was doing it for money, but I felt like I was in prison. And so every time I think back to, you know, what the NBA players were like, and yes, they were in much better circumstances, you know, they had beautiful beds and they had good food and all this other stuff. But at the same time, you don't have your freedom. You know, you don't have the ability to just go and do whatever the heck you want which these guys, I mean, they're all about that, man. They, they love to go out. They love to party or a lot of them like to be home people or whatever. And, and to not be able to do that, I got to imagine for two months, that's, that's, that's got to affect these things. So when I look at it from a college perspective, if they were to ever, if they were to suggest doing something like this, I think that would be really hard on these guys Yeah. because, because we all went to college. We all remember what it was like. Um, you know, the, the, the freedom to, to go to class or not go to class, you know, to, to party or to, to not party or all, all the, all just the, the lifestyle of college and already that's being taken away from them in a, in a, to a degree. But then if you were to like make a bubble that, that is like a modified version of what the NBA has done, I don't know how 18 to 22 year olds would handle that. Yeah. I think it'd be really, really hard. Just to throw in. Um, since you brought up the, the, what you, you, you know, the insight that those players would have. Uh, so I'm not totally talking out of my ass here. Like the last episode of this podcast I did do with Jalen Agnew and she was in the bubble with the WNBA for a couple months. And what she said is like, it feels like you're at college, you're in, you're on campus, you're in your dorm or whatever. And you have like a, you know, a structured set of like, here's when you go to practice, here's when you eat. Um, the thing that she said was difficult for her was, and it was kind of, she made, she kind of joked about it, but the thing that she said was difficult for her was that there's like a lot of downtime to your thoughts. So you can, you can drive yourself a little mad. Um, and she actually felt like if she had a school, like a class schedule, on top of her basketball responsibilities inside the bubble, it would actually be more beneficial because there would be less, there would be less time to try to like fill a void. You know, you'd have more, you'd have more of your schedule like set for you and you'd know what you have to do at certain times or whatever. Um, but the, 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 the counter to that is that most of the bubbles that are being planned or were being planned at the time that that conversation took place in college basketball um, were rumored to be during um, fall break, which would eliminate the class schedule and would add, which, which would throw into the, the excessive amount of downtime where you would drive yourself crazy. So from a mental health standpoint, that kind of highlights what John was talking about there. Um, so I, I guess to, our, to the listeners right now, if you haven't checked that out and you kind of want to see some firsthand insight into what, what it was like in the bubble, um, go to whitemthereview.com. We have an hour-long conversation with Jalen Agnew about what that was like. Um, and then John's point about 
kind of countering the part of that amateurism. Honestly, one of the I think it was Ed Cooley. I'm, I hope it, I got. It was either Ed Cooley or Jay Wright. I was sitting in on. They talked about. <clears throat> they actually mentioned the fact that that college basketball players aren't employees. Therefore, it's hard to put them in a bubble. So, like, they were pretty blunt with. <laughs> they were pretty blunt with that being one of the main reasons for. That was Jay Wright, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the, that in terms of why that isn't very fe- like isn't at least the top option, if not feasible at all. So. I wasn't trying to make light of it or uncover any hidden no, truth. There. They've, they're the only talking about this. So. No, yeah. it's, it's a good, it's a good, I was just going to say it was a good point because, because, you know, it seemed like for a while there, uh, the idea of trying to cram as many games as you could into the fall break schedule um, is the, was the idea. And I still think it can be the idea. Um just not in a hard and fast bubble. It's just it's going to be easier with no kids on campus. Yeah, um, I think that's to, a big hope to handle it. Yeah. it. yeah, no kids on campus, so that the the risk is lower for all the players and coaches involved, and so that they think they could take they can get a season that looks relatively normal going, and then reassess in February when. People are back on campus and then, oh, do we need, like, have we had a ton of game cancellations or postponements? Do we need to try to bubble up in February? I think you might see that. I I, I am curious, though, if – I think it's going to take a lot of guts to do that. Don't you – because, like, they, that, that'd be – that'd require an adjustment on the fly. And I don't know if – are leagues equipped to do that? I guess – my thought is – I guess my question is, like, what's it going to take or what would it take for the Big East to decide to bubble up or any league to decide like, you know what, we're going to, because most leagues are going to operate under sort of, you know, the schedules shifted a little bit and they're going to do some things differently, but no one's bubbling up yet. And I wonder what would, what that would take to do it. Well, and the other thing too is, and we've seen how the communication and the cooperation between the conferences has collapsed in college football but that's because it's a sport whose postseason is governed by those conferences. This is, this is, you know, the postseason in this sport, of course, is governed by the NCAA. So you wonder if there's supposed to be, or there's ex- going to be expect to be more direction from the NCAA in how everyone should behave in basketball versus, you know, just the big East trying to cooperate with the big 12 cooperating with the ACC cooperating with the PAC 12 and so on. Um, and with the mistrust and kind of the, uh, I won't call it backstabbing, but certainly I don't think the leagues got along very well, you know, in July and June or June and July when, when they were trying to plan out everything for football, you wonder if any of those residual um, feelings come back to basketball and, you know, is, is there a conference that's going to try to take the lead on this and are they going to expect everyone to play follow the leader? You know, is everyone going to have the same protocols? It, it's just, uh, like I, like I said earlier, you know, we have, we've had all this time to kind of learn and it almost feels like at least from a college uh, sports perspective, we haven't learned anything. All we've, all we've learned is that these conferences don't trust each other mm-hmm. and that there's not enough cooperation. And so it's going to take, I think it's going to take someone in Indianapolis and in, in the NCAA to really kind of be the lead on this and, and kind of give everyone direction on where to go because um, unless, you know, a miracle happens and all of a sudden, you know, SEC and the Big Ten start playing together in the same sandbox again, I think we're kind of, we're back at square one, or at least it feels like we're back at square one. Yeah, I think this gives us a good thing, a good topic we can segue into because there was a schedule or a little, a little bit of a schedule released today. So we have a little bit, we have a few more pieces of the puzzle in terms of what Creighton's, uh, you know, Thanksgiving through December will, or through Christmas will look like. Um, and it's an interesting point you brought up there with the NCAA because, you know, they haven't really like put their foot down. Maybe that's not the right way to say it, but like they haven't really like shown the path that you have to follow. Like, and, and I'm sure there's like an oversight limitation there. They can't necessarily, they're more of a, you know, they're a governing body, but they're not like, uh, you know, they can't mandate every conference to be in lockstep with the same directive. So you know, they have right now, right now, if you read through all their health guidelines, all you keep running into that word suggestion, like, so it's just, here's what you should do. 
or here's what you, we think you should do if you run into this problem or that problem or you start testing positive here or there in your tier one grouping. Um, and I think it was kind of interesting to see how um, straightforward certain Big East coaches were today about the lack of uh, uniformity that has already been seen throughout the power conferences, certainly in college basketball in terms of following those suggestions. Um, and then there was kind of talk today if, uh, you know, from the Big East itself about how strict they're going to enforce that 14 day um, quarantine for positive results, or if they're going to knock it down um, to something that's more manageable from the, from a school standpoint. So I guess from that perspective right there, when you look at Creighton's schedule, um, so right now we know they're going to South Dakota for Utah and then two more games there, the 25th through the 27th. Um, they have Kansas confirmed on December 8th. I think Kennesaw State released their schedule that had Creighton on it still. So that's a an unconfirmed from Creighton side of things uh, game that's coming to Omaha. And then the Big East obviously released the four, um, the first four games for Creighton in December. Uh, that's the 14th at home against Marquette. And then the 17th and 20th, they're at St. John's and at UConn. And then uh, – you know, two days before Christmas, they're at home against Xavier. So just when you look at that group of games that have been confirmed from Creighton's uh, perspective, and then you add it into the um, guidelines, the suggestions um, for testing and whatnot, and we know they're going to be ramping up to three tests per week here pretty soon um, as they get closer to the season. I think maybe in a week or so, they say, they were going to start testing three times a week. Um, just from a feasibility standpoint, how, how realistic do you feel that schedule is in terms of being able to accomplish it, both from a regular travel standpoint and just, uh, you know, keeping players safe on Creighton's end of it perspective? John, the you want to start? I mean, listening to the coaches today, they didn't seem very optimistic about it. Um, so I'm not optimistic either. I, I don't know, like uh, – You can help them feed off of what they think, right? The hope, I mean, again, the hope is, is without – with campus basically empty, you're going to have less interaction with uh, with people that may have the virus, and you're kind of in your own bubble. So I guess that's the hope is that we, they don't have a true bubble, but they have these sort of like pseudo bubbles on campus with just the basketball team. And so maybe that's the answer. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's hard to envision scenarios where it, 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 there are zero positive tests in the month of December for, for an entire league. But I guess that's just the route that they prefer to take. I, the travel piece, I'm not really – I don't know if I'm that concerned about it. Really? Um, just because teams – they travel charter and they can isolate. I mean, John, uh, you, you've been on those trips. Like, they – you you're basically bus to the plane and you don't really have much contact with with uh with many people especially when they fly into some of those smaller private airports it's like there's you can avoid uh the rest of society basically pretty oh, easily yeah. i think so yeah. i i think the private plane piece is 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 huge now they, they may have to stay overnight at a hotel which adds a little obviously that that increases the risk but there's also the possibility that for some of the trips some of the shorter trips um, you could fly in day of the game and uh, and then fly back out after the game and so you're not even staying in a hotel. So that piece isn't as concerning, I guess, for me, but uh, I don't know. As, as many of the coaches mentioned, the 14-day quarantine, which is a recommendation from the NCAA, as we said, not a mandate, but it appears like in the Big East, it's mandate. They're following the recommendations of the NCAA. So um, 14 days is two, that's two weeks. So that I mean, if you got a positive test on December 10th on your team, that would wipe you out for all of those Big East games that they announced today. Um, so you'd miss all those games, and then there'd be a ramp-up period, uh, maybe a week or so to get your guys back into shape, back in the game shape, ready to go, um, and then you'd go from there. So And you have the hard test, too. So I think Jay Wright actually said it's more of a 23-day hiatus than a 14 yeah and, and Villanova's had it they they paused workouts a couple months ago because they had a couple positive tests and Marquette's currently Marquette's, going through it yeah. right now yeah. Marquette's doing it right now so I no, don't know John, man like that's it 
it, it does seem unlikely that they're going to get through it without any disruption. But then again, that, I mean, that's kind of part of what you have to prepare for and get yourself ready for is the, the likelihood or the possibility that games are going to get canceled. And uh, as a, as a, if you're a fan of the sport, deal with the chaos as best you can. I don't know if that means like popping a couple beers extra or something like do, do that. And if you're the players, and, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> and if you're the players and coaches, then uh, mm, yeah. I'm glad you brought up that. Creighton fans, you know, popping an extra because John can. Oh, sorry. I think I'm glad John, you brought up that part of it. So I think John can talk about this a little bit. Um, you can use our last names, or if you want, or you can call like, maybe Bishop like. Yeah, you yeah. call me. J- Bishop. You call me Bishop. I, I, I call Johnny. John, John, I call me Johnny. So I feel like Johnny and John will be. Watching. What about Jay Bish? Is that Jay a thing? Jay Bish. I, I bit, I've been used to being called by my last name forever. I don't know. B Hop. I, I, you know, B Hop. Uh, you know, Johnny B. You know, I've been called. I just don't want to say like I, Bish. I don't want to say like Bish and think I'm calling him like a Bish the whole time. That, I, I, people was, call me that. that that's, that's fine. Not, that's not. That's not right. Um, Listen, uh, but no. To John's point yeah. on, on, I think the travel part of it is, isn't a, a a big concern because I mean, here's how basically it works. We meet at in, the, in a normal season, of course. We meet at we meet at at Epley Attack Air. Um, we're all together. We get on the two planes. There's two separate planes. You know, team is on one, coaches and staff are on the other for the most part. Um, we fly in, we land. It's always, uh, it's always at a private terminal. Get right on the bus, go to the hotel, um, get our rooms. Usually there's dinner after that. My guess would be that they'll have, you know, they'll probably have um, maybe more of a team, I mean, like a, like a dinner in the hotel instead of, you know, going out to a restaurant or something just to kind of limit um, uh, outer, any more outside contact. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you come back, you watch film, you go back to the hotel. I mean, there's not usually a lot of, you know, going about town, obviously. And, you know, if you go to like a place like Washington, DC, we've done tours and stuff like that. I'm guessing those things won't happen this year. Um, but I, I think the travel part of it is the most manageable. What I'd be interested to see is, you know, the, that St. John's Yukon uh, double dip, you know, in a normal year, they would, they would stay out there on the East coast. You know, they'd play the first, you know, go out there, play the first game, you know, go to the next city, stay in that city for a couple of days and then play the next game, you know, find a place to practice, whatever would they fly out and fly back and then fly out and fly back so that they can be home instead of being out on the road? That's, that's certainly a question. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I think, you know, just based on how, how organized Creighton has been a, a, over the years, a, and they've really got it down to a science now. I mean, that, that first year in the Big East was a little more helter-skelter because it was all new stuff to everybody. I mean, you know, getting used to flying to, you know, Queens instead of Terre Haute, um, you know, is, is, a, is a world of difference. But, you know, once you got past that first year, they've had it pretty much down to a science. So I trust those guys, um, you know, Jeff Vanderloo, uh, John McHugh. I mean, those guys, those guys will have a good plan. And I'm sure they've been talking about it and going over the logistics. Um, the, the real concern is going to be, you know, what happens when you're not practicing? What happens when you're not playing? Um, and, 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 you know, again, keeping, keeping uh, above, your head above water on the whole testing thing because that's, that's going to be the real concern is, you know, if, if, if you get a positive test, boom, you know, two weeks and you're done. Did you bring up Tara Ho just for Johnny there? Is that what you did? <laughs> Love me some Tara Ho. <laughs> Paradise, baby. Paradise. <laughs> Terra Dice. Uh, <laughs> That's my hometown. Yeah, hey, you know, I never, I never had a bad experience in Terre Haute. I really didn't. You know, everyone, yeah. everyone used to tell me how it smelled there. I, I mean, I, I thought it was fine. I like sycamore trees. You know, it, it was fine. Yep, yep. You must, you must have went on like the the third Thursday of the month. Uh, those are the, the third Thursday of the month is the day it didn't smell. Every other day it did. <laughs> It's so weird about Terre Haute. Look, I just want to say this real quick. Like, 
You go up there, you don't even realize that there's a stench coming from somewhere until you move out and then you come home to visit and you're like, what? I grew up in this. How? Well, you know, and listen, it was the same way in Fremont, right? Because we had the Hormel's plant in, mm-hmm. on the south side of town. If the wind came out of the south, there would be days where it would smell like you were on a hog farm. But you, you got used to it. You were just like, oh, wind must be out of the south today. And you go about your daily business. So, yeah, those types, you know, once you get away from it for a while and then you come back, it's like, oh, wow, I forgot about this. But, we, yeah, when you live in it, it's like – you know, it's like living with your, you know, gassy grandpa or something, you know, it just kind of smells like the bathroom. What's the, what's the worst road trip in the Big East? Since you're, since we're talking about sort of the, the low mm. points of the valley, taking those trips, like which trip in the Big East, like, cause all these, I mean, we're talking about some of these cities that the teams get to go to are pretty sweet. So they are now, um, I, first of all, I love Providence. I think Providence is, Providence is a great road trip. It's a great city. Um, let's see. I, I honestly, I'm not, I'm not fond of going to New York. I, 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 really? you know, you like kind of been, once you've been there and you've done that, you're fine. It, it, you know, for the big East tournament, it's exciting because yeah, you're in the heart of it all and you're right next to the garden, but you know, just the whole bus trip to get in and out of the airport is, is a pain in the butt. I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of like, once I've done it, I'm good with it. Um, Cincinnati, Cincinnati's okay. Uh, Milwaukee's okay. I'm a Chicago. I'm a big Chicago guy. I love Chicago, so I always okay. That. I like Chicago too, but Rosemont was definitely my worst because, like, remember when I used to play at that? What was that place called? It was like a Disney castle run down or something. What was that? Allstate was, Arena. Yeah, Allstate, Allstate Arena. Arena. Hey, yeah, that was actually good because the because we literally flew into O'Hare, which is right across the street. I mean, we I mean, it was like in and out. We got home so fast, and now we have to like <laughs> drive further because you know they're playing at the new arena. I, I love that. that. I love I hate, that. I, that was I hated that road trip. That was that's my <laughs> that's that's the one I'm glad but, never has to happen again. The, the John, tough- John's John's right though. I mean, there's really not a bad city in the Big East. All of it is is cool. All of it. The, the toughest one for me is St. John's. Especially when they if they played at Madison Square Garden, I'd be cool with it. But they play up in Queens on campus and that place gets deserted after the game. So <laughs> me sitting there writing my story like I'm the last guy leaving the arena and the campus is dark. I made the mistake of staying at an Airbnb like in queens and so i had to walk from the campus to my airbnb and it was scary like i saw more police cars than regular cars uh civilian cars i believe it yeah and and so i was i was definitely speed walking uh to that spot but so and then the next time i think i got locked in the parking lot which apparently is a common occurrence if you talk to oh yeah riders across the league because you got like Again, it's, it's a late game, and you sit there and write, and nobody's left. So St. John's has been tough for me. It's just – it's oddly located in the middle of Queens. And Yeah, that's not fun. It's not. It's not fun for the team either because, you know, you stay out by the airport, but then you got a bus all the way in. I hate mm-hmm. the arena because um, everything's so cramped. But I love the – I love Carneseca. So that's really kind of the trade off. Yeah, I like, I like the fans there. They're a little feisty. Well, yeah, I don't have a problem with the people, but it's just, I guess, and this is, again, a radio thing, but, I mean, we are, there is literally. There's no room, I I know. The the table (laughs) I'm sitting at right now has more width than the room between my back and the the sideline. I I mean, I I think the first year I sat right next to you guys, and Nick was like, me and him were like bumping knees the whole time, because there's there's no, you you can't, (laughs) there's no room. No. And so I was trying to like squeeze in. Sometimes my elbows go flying as I type. I'm trying to avoid that because Nick's right next to me. And then he's going wild because Justin Patton's doing crazy things. Yeah, he's doing this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was the game. I think that was the yeah. JP coming out party game, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, everyone was excited because JP was going crazy. And Right. I have, I, I, you know, St. John's is, is tough for me, but I do love New York City. Marquette, yeah. I've made, I, it's my own fault, but I drive that every time I make it and it's just that you know you get to like Dubuque Iowa on your way home and you're like oh my god what have I done <laughs> <This is laughs> so got four hours to go yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awful 
awful. It was a huge mistake I did it every I think, time. But I can I, I can only relate to the Queen's experience for John for Johnny uh, in my, when when the Big East Women's Room was still at McGrath before they built uh, that new Wintrust Arena or whatever. Because Wintrust is like um, right next to like two or three hotels. Like it's like oh, it's perfect. Yeah, it's like you can walk to your hotel and walk to the arena and back. Like, but McGrath. It's perfect for people who are going to the game, but uh, everyone else in the city is like, I don't know how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, you know, they, they, they bragged about, you know, how it was going to be closer to campus and all this other stuff. And it's like, well, I, I guess technically it is, but you still got to jump on the train and go all the way down there. And, and then walk. Right. There's and then little, walk, and yeah. it's usually cold, and it's right. and as you can tell, the attendance has hasn't gotten any better. So oh. anyway, yeah, Matt, Mag- go ahead. McGrath, Mag- 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 McGrath is like right next to campus, so like you're walking, but like you leave there at you know tournament ends like you know nine o'clock, so you like call your Uber, and then like you're walking, but then you feel like every car that like slows up next to you is like shit. Is this an Uber or is this like about to, about to get shot right here? What's going on? You don't know where you're at, like. So I'm just like, all right, now I got to be cautious. Like, <laughs> um, that's the only one I can relate to in terms of like how ominous it gets at nighttime is my craft, uh, on the boss campus. Um, but I, I'm sorry, onto the schedule though. Like, I think an interesting point was brought in, and uh, John Bishop, I think this is a good way to like, because you cover, you know, Nebraska from a certain angle, and you talk to a lot of people that do cover it on a regular basis. The Big Ten obviously didn't leave itself. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but they didn't leave itself any wiggle room. You know what I mean? Cancellations are basically not going to get rescheduled. That's like, so you have, you know, they're going through it right now in the state, but it it seems like the Big East at least has, because they're starting conference games in mid-December, they're giving themselves some, like, some cushion at the back end between the end of what their 20-game slate would be if they get everything cancellation-free. Um, and then between that and that sort of tournament. Um, so I guess from the way they're setting things up, how, how likely do you feel like it from, from just from a planning standpoint, it'll be to get 20 games in to your league slate or at least close enough to it to qualify for the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, because of how much time they're kind of giving themselves to throw makeup games in here or there, as opposed to, what you're seeing with the Big Ten in football, for instance. You know what's interesting, though, Matt? It's like Al Ackerman made the point today that there won't be a ton of wiggle room in the schedule. There'll be a little bit of flexibility, I think she said, after the holidays. But, That's like, right. on the back – yeah, after Christmas. But, like, the back end of the schedule, well, it, it'll – you know, maybe they can – isn't that why they didn't release January though, right? Because they. I think that's part of the reason, but I mean, she made the statement. I I don't yeah, yeah. I didn't get a chance to ask her a follow up on it, but she made the statement that there's not going to be a ton of um, extra room on the back end of the schedule because the NCAA tournament is still going to be played in March, at least to this point. Yeah. And so Planning. the the window for conference games hasn't really increased considerably. Um, when you consider that the big East is moving from 18 to 20 games. So okay. yeah, yeah, it, it did add two, four games in, in December, but two of those games weren't on the schedule in the first place. So like, again, there's a little bit of room, but it's not like a, an amazing amount. Now, if they bubbled up um, or really loaded up in early January um, before students went more back on campus and at, on in, in these lead sites, <coughs> then maybe you could then, create an opportunity to play more at the end but well but yeah w- when you think about it um under the old schedule and un- under the 10 team conference you had 18 games that basically started around new year's yeah and then you know went through until the the first weekend in march well based on you know what we've got today they're going to get four of the 20 in so ne- so essentially starting that you know New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, which I believe is in the midweek or late in the week this year. Um, You're talking about 16 games in the same window that you used to play 18 games. And yeah, there was, you know, you usually, everybody got a bye. um, But I I mean, she's right. You know, it it builds in a little bit of leeway, but it's really not as much as you would think. 
which is why I'm kind of surprised that maybe um, they didn't consider starting a little earlier and maybe trying to get in five or six Big East games before Christmas. So they have canceled the non-conference and just gone league only, do you think? Well, see, and, and that was that was kind of my thought initially was, I mean, you know, co- that's what college football essentially did. Yeah. And I'm not saying what college football did was, was a great idea or how they've executed it has been a great idea, but – I'm, but it's the way you can manage things most. I mean, you can all have uniform testing. You can all have uniform protocols. You know, you're not having to rely on teams from other conferences who might have more stringent or more lenient, you know, uh, protocols than you do. So you're keeping everything in house. I, I was a little surprised that they didn't, you know, maybe consider turning the schedule on its head and saying, okay, we're going to start, you know, Thanksgiving. We're going to take advantage of the time off for the kids on campus. We're going to try to get in, you know, our conference games. And then on the back end, if there's time, Mm. we can play these multi-team events or non-conference schedule or non-conference games, you know, stuff. And so you can at least get in the games that to you matter the most, your conference games. And if there's room on the backside, then you can fill in with the non-conference stuff later. That was my big thing. That's what I thought should have happened from the, from the beginning too, John, because I thought, um, you know, the non-conference games, a lot of those could be regionally based. And, and in February, when uh, the likelihood increases that you might have cancellations or postponements because students are back on campus, well, maybe if you are set to play, if Creighton's set to play UConn and that game can't happen, well, maybe it can – play UNO or play K-State or Iowa State, you know, and it's an easier game to sort of schedule based on the region. And I, I was hoping that there would be a possibility to have some of those types of things. Now, I think there's there's a chance that um, – I thought Greg McDermott alluded to this in one of the conversations we've had over the last month or so, that maybe the Big East will allow teams to break out of the conference if they – just momentarily if they have multiple games canceled because of – you know, other teams testing positive. Like if Creighton has a week where it had, it was originally scheduled for two games and both of those opponents suddenly can't play. Could the Jays then knowing that it wouldn't make, be able to make up those games, go find another game just to stay fresh. Um, Maybe that would be something, but yeah, I'm with you, man. I I think that the, the season starting, around Thanksgiving or right after Thanksgiving with conference games like that to me would have made the most sense. Cause then you could have, if you wanted to bubble up, you could have, um, or you could have just kind of just done a, a blitz of as many games as you could run the, run through those and then uh, see what you could make work in February. But well, yeah, why can't, why can't the multi-team events be, you know, you know I know Rass and guy, everyone was talking about maybe using Omaha as that bubble. Why couldn't you start your, your season with a Big East tournament, I mean, they're all regular season games, but you can bubble up, you can play, you know, two, three games, whatever the case may be, kind of get your conference season started and then go from there and kind of fill in the rest of your schedule. And then after that, if there's room, you know, play your Nebraska's, play your Kansas's, play, you know, whomever. I mean, we've seen, you know, with, with what, uh, UNL is doing with their multi-team event. Obviously, they're able to, you know, organize something uh, with a lot of area teams. There's plenty of t- – that, that's the flexibility that basketball has that football does not. you got a ton of teams around here that are within driving distance that you can play, and, and you're not leaving your uh, – you're not even leaving your region, um, and, and you don't have to worry about playing, you know, lower division teams. You're all division one. So, um, yeah, I would just think that that would have made a heck of a lot more sense um, because it's then... just like it, it feels like co- like coaches just didn't want to be working out kinks in conference play in terms of like their team continuities and things like that. Because otherwise, uh, probably, but there's that, been there's so much that... criticism and backlash for, for trying to put these non-conference schedules together. It's like, well, why are you even bothering? You know what I mean? See, I, I just I guess I, the thing that frustrates me is is that and I said this when when it came to college football I don't care about the playoff I don't care about any of that 
I just wanted to get games in, maybe crown a division champion, crown a conference champion. I would have been happy with it. Really? Now, obviously, you don't want to do that with basketball because the March Madness is such a big deal. But I think there could have easily been a way where you keep everything in conference and you can still have a tournament at the end if everything's safe to do it. Yeah. Um, you, maybe you expand it for one year or maybe you modify it in such a way so you, know, you can work more teams in um, so that you can have the tournament, make your revenue, all of that other stuff. But, but why it was necessary to even think about these multi-team events, I mean, you're seeing what's, what's happening with the ESPN events in Orlando, and now you got, you know, a couple of dozen schools that are like, what do we do now? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't see why that was necessary. And as far as, you know, using your conference games to work out the kinks, what's more important, that or playing the damn game? I just play the games. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Because everyone's working out their kinks at the same time. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, it's not like anyone's right. got an advantage, yeah. you right. know? So. I, I, here's the thing, though. I am happy that we're going to see some non-conference games because it just doesn't – while I agree with you in terms of keeping the protocols the same and being able to kind of build in flexibility within your schedule um, if you do league only, it just doesn't make sense for Creighton to not play – nebraska and to have like to not play these regional rivalry games that are just like right down the street yeah um that to me i mean going to south dakota for a tournament isn't like you know even though they're not playing regional teams they're going to a regional area to play those teams kansas is regional it's just um, the time of it. Would be, I, I, yeah yeah. It doesn't necessarily – they didn't have to stick with the traditional scheduling format where it's non-conference and conference. Like, they right. could have mixed it up a little bit mm -hmm. more or yeah. pushed the non-conference to the end. Um, but I do I do like that college basketball is at least trying. And obviously, some teams are not going to be able to do it. And some games are going to be canceled. And some teams aren't going to be able to match testing protocols. And they're not going to be able to play. That's fine. That's just the way it is in this in this this on this landscape that we're dealing with. But – make an effort. I think that's important. And I think it's important for the lower and mid major schools um, to have the opportunity to play some of the upper echelon teams in division one for a, whatever a segmented paycheck or a, just a portion of the money that you would get normally for a buy game, but also the exposure piece too. I think that's important for the sport. So yeah. like, well, especially happy... if the eye test is going to be more applicable for the SBA tournament yeah. than ever before. So yeah. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, that's pretty much what Max said today was, um, you know, uh, this, if there ever was a year, you kind of throw the numbers out and you use your let your eyes to do the judging. I mean, that's that's probably what's going to have to happen yes. is, yeah. because you're not going to you're not going to be able to do a lot of cross comparing because, you know, one team might get a chance. Like, for example, if Creighton gets to play the games that are currently on the schedule, I mean, mm -hmm. they're going to have a lot of great resume building uh, and and not everybody's going to get a chance to have an equal opportunity um, even amongst power schools have an equal opportunity um, to, to, to play as many quality opponents. So um, yeah, it's going to be a very unbalanced playing field when it comes to, you know, some teams will have an excellent strength of schedule. Others, you know, are going to be below average and, and you're just going to have to, you're going to have to, you know, put your resume out there and cross your fingers and hope that you impress people enough to say, yeah, these guys deserve to be in, but they'll, they'll, they'll be complaining, you know, they'll be, you know, whining about who got in and who didn't get in. And you know what, after the year we've had, I'm all for it, man. I'll, I'll take, I'll take whining over who got, who got in and who got out any day over the whining that we're getting right now. Has it been a year yet? Like, man, it just feels like 20. Um, yeah. Uh, so another bit of news, I mean, obviously all the preseason um, accolades and storylines that were given to us uh, were announced today. First uh, was the standings. Um, Villanova won with nine first place votes. Creighton two with two first place votes. Who were the uh, two? Jay Wright. You'd have, I mean, yeah, Jay Wright, and then who else would you think would give him a nod? Probably, remember, probably Ed. I was going to say, so. I remember Cooley voted for Seton Hall. I think two years ago. Okay. He's alone, dissenting, so he likes to, not he likes going to, over. He likes boat. to rock the boat. Yeah, <laughs> I think he's a good bet. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Providence three, UConn four, Seton Hall five, Marquette six, Xavier seven. <clears throat> Excuse me, 
Butler 8, St. John's 9, DePaul 10, Georgetown 11. First uh, topic on this, um, 1 and 2. Villanova, the unanimous 1, Creighton 2nd. It's not a tie. It's not close. It looks like – I mean, it's kind of – I mean, relatively close, but it looks like Villanova's, you know, was definitely the team to beat, if you will, on most people's ballots. So thoughts on considering what they're bringing back, what they're replacing, where they finished last year and everything. Are you surprised that there is a separation there instead of like a, a co-champion or a, a reverse order? I'm not. <laughs> I mean, it's Villanova, you know. A lot of these preseason polls are based on, you know, your perception anyway, and the perception is fair, fairly earned because they've been the best team in the conference the last decade is that, that they're it. And, and, you know, I guess from a Creighton perspective, all I would say is I actually like it because that'll just give the guys even more to shoot for. You know, uh, if, if there could ever be a time where a team feels disrespected being picked to finish second, even though they won the league last year and they held the tiebreaker over – everybody uh, that they tied with, uh, I'm, I'm fine with it. And, and listen, it, they're going to be a good team. Uh, you know, they're, they're Villanova, you know. Um, I, I think their bench is going to be pretty good. Gillespie is Gillespie. Is Gillespie. You know, Samuels was getting better as the season went on. Um, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't fault people for doing it, and I understand exactly why they did it, because it's Villanova, you know, until – you know, it's just like the Patriots will always be picked to finish first in the AFC East because they're the Patriots. <laughs> Neatawa, I know based on conversations we've had like all offseason, you gotta you got some things to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, Tee it up, my friend. I, I, all I'm gonna say is what I've said previously that the makeup of the teams is the same. Yeah. Villanova lost its best player, Sadiq Bay, Creighton lost its top player. Tyshawn Alexander, the same. They bring back four starters, the same. Uh, they're both adding pieces like um, some integral, some guys who might be uh, key contributors to their rotation, same. So why is it that Creighton is like, oh my gosh, can they, are they going to be able to replace Tyshawn Alexander? How are they going to figure things out? This is crazy. They'll be lucky to be top 15, maybe top 25, whereas Villanova, it's like, oh yeah, number one team in the country. They're going to win the national title. Right. I, I don't disagree with the confidence in Jay Wright's ability to put this together. He's obviously got the track record, as, as John mentioned, but I think that Creighton should be getting a little bit more respect than it has been. And sure. so, Especially um, when you look at nationally, like how it – one and two in the Big East, I guess you can flip a coin and probably end up different ways either time. But, like, nationally, the gap is wider for some reason, Right. Yeah, like, if yeah. you look at some of those like way too early preseason polls, Creighton's fallen in the range of the, I don't know, twelve to eighteen or something like that. Maybe maybe it cracks top ten in some, but but whereas Nova's like one, two, or three. Right. And again, I don't disagree with that. I think Nova is loaded, but I think Creighton's loaded too. And so right. just based on what we saw last year and what these teams are bringing back, what they're adding, like. I don't see the difference there. Unless unless you're solely just like, look, Jay Wright is Jay Wright. Yeah. And I'm putting all my well, cards and chips I in think, on him. I just, I I just can't exactly get March out of my head. Like, I can't get March out of my head. Like, I'm to I, I not to go complete homer here, but like, I totally agree with like John's like comp, comp, comp. Like, they're all losing the same plane of like talent, replacing it with what we assume are, you know, maybe one or two impact players. And even today, like, uh, who's the new kid, Caleb Daniels from Tulane, that everybody's been mm-hmm. up all, all, all last season for Villanova. Jay Wright says he's kind of behind the curve, so he might not be the impact transfer that everybody kind of expected him to be. Now, they do have others, another player that might be, but... Um, well, and I think the other piece with Villanova is I think that their, like, sophomore class uh, has... M- it just like the potential of that group is really high with Justin Moore and Jer- Jeremiah Robinson or like those two guys could be draft picks next year. Um, I don't think Creighton sophomore class has that, but like they're, they're um, four level players, like below the top tier are maybe better than Creighton's. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, see, here, here, but, like, but to me, I'm like Creighton. I think if you, I think if you told, if you asked me who was playing better at the end of the year last year, I would have said Creighton. Oh yeah. And I think they, and I think they both lost a similar, player in terms of value on um, in terms of like two-way talent in Tyshawn and Sadiq Bay. 
And if you go by NBA draft boards, Sadiq was more talented if you go that alone. So that's what was throwing me off all like off season was like, why is Villanova getting like knocked down like a peg, if any, and Creighton's like 10 to 12 spots lower than where they were at the end of the year. Like, am I missing something here? Like I understand. Yeah, well, like, you, you like, actually, people are acting like Tyson Alexander was like a top 10 that's pick. Most, that's so the other part. Like, why wasn't like, he can't have a the both. Then? Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, you can't have it both. If Tyson yeah. Alexander was just like if he wasn't dynamic. Even unanimous first team all big East. Why are you telling me that Creighton can't win without him? Like, that's what I'm saying. Right. It's one or the other. Yeah. It's see, one see, the, exactly. see, Matt, you were, you were on to something though. It is about March. It's about March 2019, March 2018, March 2017, March 2016. That's where the reputation is built. And Creighton didn't get a chance to improve on its March reputation because we got, we didn't get a tournament. So, so we're just, we're, we're defaulting back to, you know, what we've always known. And again, I would say this for a team that already didn't get its March moment, uh, for a team that didn't get a chance to show itself on the biggest stage after the, after the way they ended their season, they're already motivated to give, to give these guys one more reason to be motivated. I'm all in on that. I mean, <laughs> please. And, and remember the Rob Anderson stat that Creighton has matched or exceeded its preseason yeah. expectations every single year since joining the conference, even in the second year when they weren't that good. Um, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll take my chances with getting pick number two. And <sighs> can I also say though, that if you pin me like up against a wall, I would pick Villanova over Creighton. Yeah. <laughs> Does that nullify yeah. my whole argument? My argument is that the gap isn't as big as people think it is. That's no, you're, you're, you're exactly right, John. You're exactly yeah, I told, right. If, if you told me, if you told me nothing about all these like preseason rankings and everything, and they were just like, and they released the poll today and I hadn't read any of that stuff from like, you know, Andy Katz or like, Gary Parrish or any of those guys. They were just like, hey, they picked Villanova to win the league and Creighton second. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Villanova's been the king of the league. It's like it's the gap in the national like in the national rankings that I can't get over because like Creighton is being downgraded for the same thing that Villanova is dealing with. And Villanova's not like that's the part that doesn't register with me. So I'll say this. Last year last year was the first year since year one in the big east. And part of the year one thing was just ignorance because we hadn't seen these teams up close and personal before. Wasn't Marquette the preseason favorite, right? Remember that? Yes. In, yeah. in 2013, 14. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last year was the first year when Creighton walked onto the floor with Villanova in both games where I didn't have that sense of, Ooh, do we belong here? I didn't have, I never, I didn't have that feeling in the first game. And I, I definitely didn't have that feeling in the second game. Mm -hmm. because and there was never that moment where it was like oh god here they come it, especially that second game uh, i that that may have been that may be, that that's probably one of the better games creighton's played all year was that yeah. second game in uh in philadelphia um for the first time because even even in 13 and 14 when they beat them badly twice it wasn't that they beat them because they were the tougher team they beat them because they were the more skilled team Mm -hmm. last year Creighton was the tougher team and that's the first time I've been able to say that since since you know they joined the league and and that's important because you know skill is great and but at the end of the day if you're gonna win this league you better be tough and 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 I thought Creighton was the tougher team last year than Villanova and I hadn't been able to say that before yeah um I don't know if you guys have it in front of you, so maybe you can't riff off of it very well, but what were your, I mean, what were some of the things you disagreed with with the standings? Like, was there anything that jumped out to you that didn't feel right? I think, like, one for me is, like, I would have had UConn ahead of Providence. I would have had St. Saint, Saint John's is ninth. I would have had them ahead of Seton Hall. Like, I feel like they're, I feel like St. John's is way underrated. Wait, I'm uh, sorry. You would have had St. John's ahead of Seton Hall? Yeah, Seton Hall, yes. Yes. Really? How come? Yeah. Quincy McKnight, Romaro Gill, Miles Powell, all gone. And I'm just supposed to like business as usual? What? No, I don't have any. I need to see that work before I trust it. Because Bryce Aiken, <laughs> Bryce Aiken hasn't like, he's played like 30 games his whole career. And they're expecting him to be like 
the impact guy for Powell. I don't trust that. Um, Mamu goes from, you know, first of all, he wasn't very good on the defensive end. He got abused. So he's a one way player when he's on, is he, is he an alpha? Like, is he the guy that's he's stepping into that role for the first time in his career. That's always a transition for people, for players. I don't, there's a lot I don't trust about Seton Hall yet. I need to see it to believe it first. St. John, you want to hop St. John's, I, I think, is going to have a good year. You want a hot take on Seton Hall? I think sure. by the end of the year, they're going to miss Quincy more than they miss Miles. Oh, oh yeah, I love that. Yeah. I think that. Quincy Mc, Quincy McKnight was was integral to what they did. He was a sure. pain in the butt on the defensive end, and he was a better offensive player than maybe sometimes his numbers showed. I think I think by the end, and you know. I, I, listening to your rationale and your justification, I can, I, I can almost get behind it, but I don't know. I, I trust, I trust Kevin Anderson. Willard more than I do, uh, more than Ooh. I do. Uh, Saint Mike John. Anderson, really? Right now, I'm, I do. Yeah, because he's proven in the Big hey, E. Kevin Willard last year did a great job, man. He did he have a lot of talent. I know, I'm like, I'm not, yeah, I'm, they, not, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying, like Mike Romaro Gill definitely coach. got better. Yeah, for sure. He did. All those guys got better. Quincy yeah. McKnight was was incredibly improved. Like he, I that's, thought he was the most improved player in, in the league. They, they gave you're, you're, make, you're making you know, an argument for me right now. I know that's exactly what I said. But the, no, that same logic applies to Roden and Miles Kale and Sandro. Like the the rest of the roster, I think I think they got I think their pieces, their their role players last year were were better than what they were able to show because obviously Miles Powell was the focal point. So, all right. Yeah. I think I just, Willard sometimes, you know what? Willard sometimes here's, gets, here's my, gets... my perspective of it is like Creighton had that, that gap to like that, that bridge to like gap between Marcus Foster, Kyrie Thomas, and then like Tyshawn and Mitch turning into the guys and then Marcus. Right. But there was a year in between there where they kind of like struggled a lot, you know, especially in crunch time of who's the guy you know, who's supposed to make the play here? Like, Seton Hall's going to have to go through all that organically. They don't know yet, right? So all that – so, I, like, Seton Hall's in that in that sophomore year, freshman year with Mitch Marcus Ty situation. Yeah, I mean, they're going like, to they're gonna struggle a little bit. They're going to be really inconsistent because of that. They might <laughs> – yeah, they might need Aiken to be really good. Yeah, he has to be healthy, period. Like, yeah. yeah. He's, and he's yeah. not healthy right now. So, right. So, um, yeah, those are my only, like – Complaints. I think St. John's is way underrated. Butler, I feel like, is going to struggle. DePaul and Georgetown are definitely the bottom. Uh, Marquette and Xavier in the middle with Seton Hall there. And I think I, I think UConn should be ahead of Providence, but you know they're only separated. They're only separated by two points in the voting. So I don't, I don't know what to do with Xavier and Marquette. I just like every the last three years ish, two years, I've they haven't met my expectations of what I thought they'd become. And so I don't know if that's just a product of who was on the team at the time. And now they're kind of recycling and, um, you know, tweaking their identities a little bit with just different personnel. Or if that is just a whole program culture thing, I don't know what, what they're missing those two teams, but. Um, and sometimes we get so wrapped up, you know, that Marquette the last few years has been defined by Marcus Howard and the long range bomber that, you know, I wonder if, if they, if they don't have that guy, if they can still be very productive. I mean, Woj is, Woj is a good coach. I'm not, uh, I'm not downgrading him at all, but I do wonder how, how they're going to look identity wise. Cause they were so defined by those guys that could stretch the floor and shoot from, you know, 30 feet. And it's so interesting because that's not who Wojo was as a player. I know. I've always felt yeah. that he, he's got the personnel to have a team that is just nasty and tenacious and just like can really grind you and make it tough on you defensively. Um, I I feel like he's got all these athletes. Like why hasn't his team taken that bold? I'm surprised that it hasn't gone that route. Mm -hmm. And Xavier, like, They've just been a mess offensively the last couple of years. So. <laughs> They're gonna be interested. It sounds like they've like made like an, a commitment to an identity switch. I'm gonna be curious to see what Xavier looks like, aren't you? Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think they have 
they have some good talent. That, but those those two the teams I just don't know. Like I could see one of those teams finishing top five, top four. They could both finish eight and nine. I don't know. But I agree with you. St. John's is underrated. I think that um, I was super impressed with the way that they played last year, just in terms of, especially on offense, the pace, the movement, um, the ability to kind of hit teams. Now, part of it is Creighton had trouble guarding them. Mm-hmm. The matchup, Creighton couldn't use its small ball match, uh, like small ball lineup uh, to its advantage against St. John's because St. John's played small too. But I was impressed, man. I thought, I think Anderson's a pretty good coach. And so whether – do they have the talent yet? Like, does he have all the pieces there yet? I don't know. But um, I like some of the young guys they have on that team. So, St. John's. And, by the way, Providence? You're, you're, you're not in on Providence at three? I like Providence at three. I mean, I guess – I don't know. Like, what? What are they? What are? They, I mean, they got. Dave, is David Duke like David Duke's probably gonna make a jump because he's he's in that junior year season where you usually see guys become who they are, you know. And I think he's super talented. Um, that means gonna I, drop forty in Omaha because good God, he was <laughs> he was the reason why they almost won that game. I mean, we know he's good enough too. That's for sure. Um, yeah, he'll be better. I think AJ Reeves will be incrementally better if he's healthy. Um, I thought, you know, Eddie Cooley knows how to win. They'll be, they'll be good. I just, I thought, I think, I thought there was like a clear one, two, three in terms of Villanova, Creighton, UConn uh, from a talent standpoint that was like kind of above the rest of the group. So I was surprised to see Providence get the nod. You know what I mean? Uh, at the end of it. I, I, really wonder, think, I, wonder how, I think UConn's going to be really good this year. I think they're going to. Yeah. I just wonder how Horschler's going to fit in the, Alpha role, the Alpha Diallo role, because that yeah. was such a big one for for, um, for Providence the last couple of years. I mean, his numbers are really good. I, I I didn't really see much of his work at North Florida, so I don't know, you know what what exactly they're getting in him. But if if he can fill that that Diallo role, then you know I, Nate Watson, you know is is passable. Um, but it's it, yeah, it's probably going to come down to Duke. I just at the end of the day, I mean. The, I just trust. I trust Ed Cooley. You know, I mean that yeah. that team was that team was treading water, and then all of a sudden it hit its stride. And you could arguably make, you could make them you could make the case that next to Creighton they were playing the best basketball you know in the last month of the season. Yeah, the East. You know, so um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the alpha point the alpha point that you make is a really important one because when they were really bad last year, it was because Alpha wasn't playing well. And when they when they got on a roll, it was because Alpha flipped the switch and he kind of bought. He got you know he got locked in. You know he stopped having turmoil with his head coach and all that. Like he, that was kind of like he was their guy. Their season hinged on which Alpha Diallo showed up that day, and he's gone now. So like I've got a question there. You know that's that's a big void to fill. David Duke, I think he's going to be fine. You know, can AJ Reeves be a guy that does? Um, you know, can he be a guy that can hit, you know, two or three threes a game, um, score at three levels, grab five or six rebounds, you know what I mean? Be be kind of like a Swiss Army knife like Diallo was. I don't know. So that's a tough role for them to fill, I think. Um, um, Providence uh, is one of several teams that's going to be, like, working in a transfer point guard or a transfer lead guard in the Big East this year. So that, to me, is something that, I don't really know how to process that. I, I usually um, I go in with tempered expectations anytime I'm talking about a transfer making an impact right away for a team. Even if they sat out a year, I just feel like more times than not, we tend or we, I think that a lot of people tend to um, assume the best case scenario with transfers. Yeah. And it doesn't often work out that way. So, I, but I don't know. I mean, like, obviously, they've spoken very highly, Providence has, of uh, its transfer, Jared Bynum. Um, so if if he's legit, then that could open up their offense. But, like, Providence, Marquette, UConn, Seton Hall, St. John's. Like, who else? Like, there's a it's lot like of teams. A, it, yeah, it's really kind of, the, you know – you there's a lot of teams. No, what I'm saying is there's a lot of teams that are bringing in that transfer point, that transfer yeah. lead guard. That yeah, it, they, a lot hinges on that player's ability to like make the jump. 
and settle in right away, which isn't always easy. Um, even if you're able to sit out and mesh with your team, blend in, learn the culture. So, yeah. And then, uh, I mean, I think, too, uh, you know, DJ Carton and Bryce Aikman both honorable mentions. So they're not just like, <laughs> they're not just expected to be impact players, but the big East coaches are already kind of acknowledging that they're supposed to be. If Marquette yeah. or Seton Hall are going to be good. So yeah, they picked, uh, they picked the two, two dudes who have to make the transition over, uh, over our boy Denzel. So, yeah, let's. I, I want to get to that in a second. Um, Marcus Zagorowski, preseason player of the year, probably not much of a surprise. I think we all thought co at worst, right, with Gillespie? Were you so, so I guess the yeah. question is, were, were you surprised that you got it solo? I guess is the question. No. Yeah. No, not really, because I don't think they were going to do a, a do a co deal. I mean, last year, last year was so easy because you know everyone was talking about you know Miles and Marcus, uh, Marcus Howard. Um, I guess that could have seen them going with that, but, you know, uh, Zagorowski was so, so huge last year and he made such a jump, um, yeah. that I think, I think it, it was, it, it didn't seem like to me, it was that out of bounds. It didn't really surprise me though. It wouldn't have surprised me if they'd gone with Gillespie for the same reasons I talked about, you know, why did Villanova get picked first? Uh, just because, you know, they can, but. I think this was just kind of the bone to throw out there and say, well, you know, we pick Villanova first here, but we'll pick Zagorowski for player of the year. For sure. Uh, Mitchell Ballack, second team, um, best shooter in the conference. Makes sense for him to get a nod. Uh, yeah, I do think, I, you know, I was kind of surprised when the teams were released that Denzel wasn't on there because of, you know, obvious reasons like John's pointed it out, you know, when, when he was kind of writing what, like, back when Creighton. Here's what Creighton's got coming back. I mean, Denzel was one of the best players in the league last year, and especially when you take out the guys who aren't coming back, in, t in terms of the returnees, like, he's, you know, I think he was, like, sixth in league playing scoring and, re you know, returning sixth man of the year. And then, so I kind of felt like he got snubbed at first. Um, and then I was looking back at it recent history since, like, realignment when Creighton and Butler and Xavier joined, but, like, uh, there are actually three players who have won sixth man of the year um, with eligibility remaining, come back and not been selected for any of the all preseason teams. Um, and he's in good company. It's Andrew Rousey from Marquette, JP McHero from Xavier and Josh Hart from Villanova. So those are three guys <laughs> who all won sixth man of the year. And then the following fall weren't selected for the preseason's first, second or honorable mention teams. So it's actually kind of a trend I found out when I looked into it more and I shouldn't have been that surprised, but I was surprised still. Were you guys? Yeah, I was because all the coaches were so complimentary of Denzel during the season last year. Maybe they took to took into account that he's going to change positions and uh, that impact that he had as a like mismatch guy at the four and the five won't be as evident or as impactful because he'll be playing more as the three, but I think the skills are going to translate just fine. And even if, I mean, he's going to get more opportunities to score too. Um, so I was surprised I was, but then again, I know that you can't have like the whole great team right. yeah. honored. So you got to be. Well, uh, remember you added a new line somewhere. Here. So you had to I make Bryce Enzi got in there. Like, why, is Bryce, why is Bryce Enzi on the all preseason teams? So I was like, you can knock him off. Now I agree with that. Yes. Yeah. I was like, All right. There's uh, another. There was one other player on there too that kind of surprised me. I was like, mm, "Which sure. one got you there?" I can't remember now. I got Scruggs. It was a Scruggs. No, I like Scruggs. May, I like May, Scruggs. Nate Watson. Yeah, yeah, it was Nate Watson. Yeah. It was Nate yeah. Watson. Okay. So you're basically just don't want any. Big, you're, you don't want any big guys anymore. You don't want. Any no, I did compile a list of who I thought was going to be on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's no big man on my list yeah. except for jeremiah robinson earl gotcha he's not even like a true i mean he is he's a really good rebounder uh but he's like offensively i don't think of him as a big how about how about charlie moore first team that's that was pretty that over was james book night yeah that was an eye-opener <laughs> I usually, yeah, I, you, you know, know usually I don't see think. the, you usually don't see the like the tenth place team get a first team nod. Like that didn't, that didn't mesh with me. I mean, he he had numbers last year, but it's not like, 
and again, you know, seeing him twice a year up close and personal, I, I, it's not like Charlie Moore took over games or anything like that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If he would have, they might have won a few more. Down, exactly. those ones early that could have been season changers. Um, I don't know. Didn't Shamari Pons get it, like, preseason all the geese after they had finished last or something like that? Might have, yeah, probably. I thought, I thought he got recognized in a similar fashion. Yeah, they, they could have bumped him down. They could have bumped Charlie down, but um... – mm-hmm. I, I, again, I get it because again, a lot of the times it's like, okay, who are the stats? Oh yeah, he did. I mean, Slide honestly, on. maybe some, maybe you some you coaches put Aaron Thompson on there instead of Charlie. I wouldn't even have noticed. Like I wouldn't even. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't maybe even have thought. Coaches... Oh man, Charlie got snubbed. I wouldn't even. Have maybe they just forgot about James Book Knight. Yeah, exactly. They're like, oh, UConn joined the league. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, we have to have a second team, and we got UConn in here, guys. You forgot to vote. And then there's something wrong. Willard, Willard downvoted all the UConn guys. Yeah. Will, Willard, <laughs> Willard and Cooley were like, no UConn guys on my downvote. <laughs> That's why they ended up where they were. Not that everybody's funny. happy they're back. Yeah, yeah. for sure. The coaches, well, all, all those Northeast coaches, except with the exception of Villanova, probably are a little bit. I think, did, I think I tweeted something like that out or whatever that like went crazy for a minute. I was like, Creighton, Butler, Xavier – are all like, hey, UConn or whatever. Villanova's like, whatever. We got Natties and stuff. We don't care. And then, like, Georgetown, St. John, Seton Hall, Providence, like, burn in hell, basically. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny, though. It's good, though. I like a little heat with this with this conference. I think it, it matches pretty well. Um, just gotta get it's going to make New York interesting when we get back to having people in the in the garden again. Oh, for sure. Oh, my God. Because that that'll that'll definitely bring some juice. If, if and, and, and that was a good thing, because you know those first couple of years of the Big East tournament, it wasn't like it didn't feel like the Big East tournaments we watched on TV. But these last couple of years, the crowds have been really good, uh, and and now you bring in another you know basically a subway team into uh, into the Garden, and you know they're just going to be excited to be back. It, that's why it's unfortunate, you know, all this other stuff had to go down, but because it would have been a lot of fun to see what the reaction would have been like this year. But e- even next year and the years after that, seeing UConn in that building with all their fans, it's going to be yeah. crazy. Gonna... Get, get, get ready. <laughs> There's going to be knife fights all over the place. I'm, I can't wait. Um, last topic of uh, this episode, I think, is um, we should end on. Uh, I, the other piece of news today was that there isn't a conference-wide policy in terms of uh, fan attendance, um, which means it's being left up to the individual schools to kind of assess their local situations and determine it that way. Um, so I guess the first question to introduce this topic is how do you guys feel about there not really being a, a, a policy that limits um, schools from doing that? Do you feel like that's the right way to go about things? Um, you know, because obviously you open up competitive advantages for certain teams if they have good situations to host fans or whatnot. Others don't. I guess there's some – there could be some infighting that way, but I don't know. It kind of feels like that makes a lot of sense if there are certain areas that are doing a good job at limiting spread and in their communities that they could have people in the building and whatnot, right? Yeah. yeah I, I, think, um, I, I think a lot of the – a lot of the problem with how, you know, the big 10 brought back football was, you know, just having the conference wide policy and claiming that there's some kind of competitive advantage. It's not like, it's not like if, if Creighton has fans and Providence doesn't, for example, I, it, it, I would be shocked if there are a lot of people, I mean, yeah, for sure. We're talking, we're talking a couple thousand, I'm guessing. And I'm totally guessing I'm not working on any inside information. Yeah. Let me be clear. I do not want full, st- full and I'm sorry. Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not going to have that. So, 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 you know, most of it's going to be just to have somebody there and, and some atmosphere and maybe allow some of your better, you know, fans to, to come and attend, but we're not going to have 18,000 people at CHI. We're not going to have 10,000 at Dunkin' Donuts Center. That's not going to happen. So I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I'm glad that the league at least, you know, has enough trust in, because similar to the big 10, 
this this conference this footprint covers basically the same geographic area from Nebraska yeah. all the way to the coast and 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 you can see how the mistrust in the Big Ten has caused these rifts I'm glad to see that you know this conference is saying you know what we'll let you handle it um, we're, we're going to trust you make your judgment and the way Mac talked today I mean it's it's not a guarantee that there's going to be fans at CHI, at least at the start. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like it's not trending that direction, right? It's, now. it's certainly not. I mean, he, he acknowledged the, you know, the, the rise in case numbers in Nebraska and, you know, and I think they're, I think they're going to want to be as, uh, as responsible as they can be because uh, the last thing you want is, you know, some kind of a reputation that you're creating super spreader events and things like that. So, sure. um, I'm glad I'm glad they're leaving it up to the schools, but there's not going to be a competitive advantage. I mean, you know, the money they're going to make off of this isn't going to be very much. And, you know, yeah, there might be a couple thousand fans, but it's not going to be a full house. Yeah. I think if you're, if your arena is named the CHI health center, you cannot have <laughs> the reputation of being a, like spreading the virus. Like, no, right. you got to make sure you have all, your your eyes dotted and your t's crossed because that's two on the nose right (laughs) (laughs) yeah you can't uh and conversely like they should be able to make this happen too find a a safe way to make it happen um but so what does that mean for depaul because they're all state so you should be in good hands there no they're at wintrust now oh that's right it's not all state it's wintrust never mind it's a bank i forgot (laughs) sorry (laughs) no i'm too late bad joke bad joke edit that out (laughs) I mean, who looks good right now in the Big East? Like what? UConn, St. John's, okay mm-hmm. for Carnesecca? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, right now, UConn's probably the only one who's like probably greenlit at this point. Feels good about what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, though, I mean, I just had family move back from there and they're not because, you know, they, they've got some pretty decent restrictions. So. I don't know if that's going to be a deal, you know, Queens, New York city, you know, how much are they going to want to come back in Seton hall? I mean, that's off campus building. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I I don't, I don't know who, I mean, a lot of these buildings are off campus buildings. So I'm thinking the ones that are on campus, like, like Xavier, um, like, um, well, Karnasek is on campus. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like most of the schools are going to be playing in their on-campus facility, right? Like, Providence is going to be playing at Alumni Hall. I'd imagine Georgetown is going to be playing on campus. Which um, actually is good because it's not like they're drawing anybody anyway. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, we should have brought that up when we were talking about road trips. That was the that was a tough one to go to. Georgetown, NBA, yeah. yeah okay. NBA Arena with, with, no, with very little fans. With nobody there. But now yeah, you might see some of these schools. I don't know, Matt. You might see some of these schools play in their sort of large arena if there's an opening because yeah. it gives you more space to do things, to socially distance, to um, you know put up a barrier to bring fans in if you want. But if, if like Providence is playing in Alumni Hall or whatever right on campus, like it, it suddenly becomes you know everything is is kind of just you're more on top of each other. And, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it's. I, I think Ed Cooley kind of like kind of resigned to the fact that that's why they're playing there because they're not going to have fans in attendance regardless. Like they've had too much. Well, I think the Dunkin' Donuts on campus like, to have. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think the Donut Center is closed right now. I don't. I don't mm-hmm. even know if it's operating. So. Yeah, it's in the middle of the downtown. So. Right. No, I but mean, John, here, you, Creighton here has it, they, the officials have been in conversations with Mecca weekly. Um, for, for months now, just trying to put potential plans in place. But ultimately, yeah, the positivity rates in Douglas County are going to play an important factor in the health department. Like, I think the way the state legislation is at the moment is like, if you have an event over 500 people, you have to get permission from the health department. And normally that entails a pretty significant uh, plan, social distancing plan, um, you know, and an analysis of bottleneck points in your facility, mm-hmm. uh, ways that you're going to uh, create or mitigate the risk of, of potential spread. So um, they've kind of thought through some of those things already, but, um, you know, ultimately 
when does that call get made and how do they make a determination of who gets in who doesn't i don't know when that happens and, and it's, as you guys kind of alluded to mcdermott making comments today about it um it seems like that conversation is ongoing and it changes by the week yeah. so if you want to go to crane crane games um hope that we see some improvement with the uh coronavirus data here locally mm-hmm. mask up mask yeah. up wash your hands stay away from each other I was like the only one wearing a mask today during the Big East Media Day. I noticed that. Well, you were in and your I, office, though, weren't you? Right. And then I realized okay. that everyone, literally every <laughs> single person on this yeah. call is at home. Right. Yes. That's what I was like. <laughs> That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Dude, one, I, think, I think Zagoria was literally like laying in bed while he was doing it. Like, it yeah, did. Right. What, what was going on with that? Uh, I yeah. had to go change out of my robe because I didn't want people thinking I was in my robe. So. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I like the percentage of, of media members wearing pants was probably around fifty. I was wearing sweatpants. Um, Does that count? Sweatpants count? Yeah. No? That's, okay. no. That's what I was wearing, sweatpants. Yeah. Uh, I like to be comfortable, man. Right. <laughs> hey, when you're stuck at I home, man. You, I noticed John, you changed your shirt like midway through media day too. Did you spell something? Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah. I had to go record. Yeah, like orange and, polo uh, and then like for the Creighton segment, you had like you like got a little Wardrobe changes, you know, like yeah. I like to keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's what I got to make sure. No, I'm wearing, I, yeah. I got to make sure I'm wearing the Bulls hoodie tomorrow because I wore the Yankees hoodie yesterday or today. So I'm like, I got to right. make sure I don't look like I'm wearing the same clothes every day, even though I am. So <laughs> <laughs> I've got like a in my closet. I've got a few shirts that I've just rotated. Uh, yeah. For, strictly for zoom purposes and that's it there are like there are like 10 shirts in my wardrobe that i haven't worn since march like only just, 10 yeah like i, I they're, they're, normally i would have worn them like i would have worn them out but now it's like i don't yeah no. i don't have that big of a wardrobe in the first place and i still haven't worn them um i have yeah, a feeling my suits see. aren't getting worn much this year you I should know. just wear you should just wear them on game day out of tradition john I probably should. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll show up. I'll show up in studio with with, with the suit on. Maybe That's what I'm saying. You should do like a Zoom broadcast jacket. where it's just like it's you know nothing's changed for you. It's just the location. I could. You, you know, got to give people. Make, you got to give people the voice, right? Like he's, you, you still got to be a part of it. Yeah, my my biggest. You know what? My the biggest thing I'm going to have to adjust to is, if we're doing stuff remotely is is the noise, is the fans. You know because it your energy kind of follows where the fans are going. Right? Oh, for sure. Especially so, yours, for God's sake. I haven't, I haven't called a game. I haven't called a game, you know, in a, like a room like this, my, my house since I was, you know, 10 years old and I was pretending to call games on my little, you know, football, you know, when I used to do that as a kid. Um, so, you know, to not have like fans and like the noise and the atmosphere is going to be tough. And I don't know how I'm going to pull it off. The broadcast a five point three pointer. Three pointer. Yeah. Shut up up there. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> my wife asked that. She said, "Are you going to have to do these games from home?" And I could tell the way she asked the question, she was like, "You're not going to do these games from home." I John said, Bishop's no. at a Starbucks. <laughs> I think I'm good. <laughs> you calling it from the Starbucks? You know I should. I should. I should do it. You know what I should do is I should do it from like some place here in Lincoln. And that people will really be confused. <laughs> like, wait a minute, this isn't the Huskers. Seriously, uh, that'd be funny. No, I do hope you get into the arena, John, because then your voice would echo. You and Nick, you guys' voices would echo off the rafters, and the players would be looking up at you like, "What are you? Who <laughs> are these guys?" Seriously. I was legit worried when that, uh, you know, the day the Big East tournament got canceled, when you know they announced we weren't going to have fans that that you know the refs were going to hear too much of what i was saying because you know i'm down there on the floor and so i was uh i i was i was extra careful not to not to go too far in the old commentary because i knew that you know um the guys were like running right there and there's no there's you know because you got the typical new yorkers behind you you know with their beers they're going yeah man man you missed that call you did that I didn't have that cover, so I was a little worried. So, in in a weird way, I was actually happy the game got called at halftime because I didn't knew I wasn't going to get in trouble. You should have just let it rip, man. It was only one half. You knew they were getting canceled. You should just let it go. Well, okay, I remember. So, you know, the game was starting, and that's you know, it was like five minutes before that. If you were on Twitter, you could see SEC canceled, Big Twelve yeah. canceled. I mean, all the cancellations started coming in. 
<laughs> and I remember Brian O'Connell, the one of the three refs, came over and was going to set, you know, for the tip off, be right in front of me at the end of the baseline, and 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 he could hear me. And I'm talking about, I'm reading Twitter literally on the air, saying, "Well, here we go. Uh, looks like we're going to play a game." And uh, just see that the SEC and, and O'Connell can actually hear what I'm saying. And we both just kind of looked at each other and I'm looking to him for some kind of a verbal or nonverbal cue of, Hey, are we actually playing this game? And, and, and I went like this and he kind of went like this. And it was like, <laughs> I guess we're playing. That was a universal shrug in the whole, the whole arena, basically like, are we doing this? Okay. We're doing this. <laughs> No, it was that, still surreal standing outside that elevator for the longest time that we're going to let us go up to the floor. Yeah. No, that's sh that shoulder shrug um, from the referee O'Connell. Is that who it was? That, yeah. that was that that'll forever be uh, burned into my brain as a, as a memory from that game. Just the, the, just like, oh, I, uh, what do we? Oh, yep. I guess I guess we're going to do it. I, I guess we're tipping this shit off. Let's do it. All right. Uh, so, John, you guys had. You you weren't allowed to get into the arena on time either because we we were stuck in a holding pattern. Yeah, you were. Yeah, we were all down there. We were. We were. Yeah. We came in through the media entrance, and and I'm standing there with my case, and and they weren't letting anybody on the floor, and you know we were still kind of fuzzy as to whether or not everything was going to happen, and 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 no one would tell us. Yeah, they're just not letting you on the floor, and then all of a sudden, they open the elevators, and it's like okay. But yeah, and Rob Anderson was down there. It's like, hey, he's kind of he's kind of an official member of the team here. Yeah, and we're just standing there, going, uh, "What's happening here?" It was a bit of a surreal feeling in the oh. arena as soon as you walked in. That's for sure. I remember what like one of the security guards like. I had a, um, I can't remember who gave it to me. Either Kristen or John gave me a a floor pass for that day or whatever because no one in the arena so like i just sat down low or whatever but one of the security guards like one of these like you know typical new yorker or whatever had real attitude he's like you know you should be down here and i was just like we're gonna seriously fucking go up like four floors and sit up there all by myself what are you talking about man <laughs> so i got a pass leave me alone it was like all getting tough with me and so like, jesus <laughs> man, chill we're gonna play we're gonna be like 15 more minutes what are you talking about i know where you mean go <clears throat> so it was just i, I noticed there's, there's, there's nobody there. here a couple just, cool things, or like moments that I liked in pregame. There was a I never even got to ask these guys about this because, like, you know, it didn't matter in in the grand scheme of things. But like, I saw Mitch Ballack shooting around with Coach McDermott rebounding for him in yeah. his suit and tie, and that's like something that you never see. So that was kind of cool just to see those guys interact in that way pregame, as they both are just kind of like. You know, I mean, there's Probably like 30, minutes 45 left. minutes yeah. Yeah. before the game. There's plenty of time, but they're just kind of like, let's just make the most of the opportunity. And then yeah. I remember Christian Bishop and Tyshawn Alexander as they're stretching, talking about how uh, weird it was going to be with no fans in the arena. And, and kind of they were both looking up into the, the arena, which was empty at the time because it was an hour before tip, but just sort of like visualizing in that moment, okay, yeah, we're going to have to play with – with this whole arena empty and we know what it looks like when it's full and how much fun it is. And this is going to stink. Like it's not going to be as good of an experience. And so little did they know they were the Guinea pigs for the NBA, the NHL, major league baseball. <laughs> you know, we yeah. got used to watching with no fans, but they were like the first ones to do it because mm -hmm. it's, that was still a surreal experience. Just like once the game started though, guys, I don't know how you guys felt about it. Once the game started, it kind of felt normal. It did. I, I mean, thought, I thought it felt like a normal, like a normal high level game at DJ Soul Arena. Like I thought the energy was really good. Yeah. I thought I congratulations, was... Matt. You're the first person to compare the garden to me. <laughs> I, was... <laughs> I just meant I was expecting flat energy, hardly any noise, and I was like, honestly, the people that are in the arena are kind of bringing it. So like, I was pretty impressed. Mm -hmm. Well, when people. you think about it, okay, so the people that were allowed in, and and believe me. Uh, the, the guys at Creighton had heartburn trying to figure out who was getting tickets and who wasn't because we yeah. had a lot of people on that trip and a lot of them didn't get tickets but but those are the folks I mean the friends and family games those are the ones where you know listen there might be 200 people in there but they're gonna they're gonna be in it the whole mm -hmm. time 
And that's what it's probably going to be this year. So yeah. I actually think from a visual standpoint for fans who aren't there, who are watching on TV, um, you may not notice that much of a difference. Now, in, in big moments, swell moments, when things like the momentum really um, starts to shift, that you might notice it then. But just kind of the back and forth, like fans watching on TV may not see that big of a difference, which mm-hmm. should be encouraging. I hope yeah. so. It's just until they start panning up. Into the stands. <laughs> or, when, like, oh. or when DJ starts doing this and it's like, oh, oh, wait, no, I got to look here. No, no, there's no one here. Go over there. What, are all these black, what are all these black curtains? Like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys, it was good chatting with you guys. Um, hopefully all the stuff we talked about gets to translate into a season. So we'll put our hope in the other basket that we filled today. Um, Amen. Yeah, but it was good catching up. Thanks for you guys doing this and, uh, well, we got to get up and do it again tomorrow morning for the women. So get some sleep. Um, take care to be safe out there, guys. All right. See ya. See you, John. See you, Matt. Thanks.